All right, guys, uh, tonight's presentation is really about buying, fixing, and flipping. So finding the right properties, getting them under contract, managing the remodel, and then managing uh, the sale after the fact. So we're going to go through what this process looks like so you guys understand how to manage that here in the Austin market and understand what things cost. So we'll give you a couple of rules of thumb when it comes to figuring out what things cost and what you should be paying for different things, uh, specifically when it comes to the remodel based on the price of the asset once you are complete with the project. Uh, what I find is for a lot of people, uh, uh, a lot of people want to start with buying, fixing, and flipping. Why is that? Is because it's kind of the sexiest. It's the most profitable, right? So we always want to do the things that give us the biggest return on our investment. Uh, and it's all the stuff that we usually see on TV, right? It's like, I want to do that thing that I saw so-and-so doing on TV. Uh, I will say, guys... TV may have gotten you here and may have gotten you excited, but at some point, everybody needs to just turn off the TV, unplug the TV, cut the cord on the TV, uh, because the things that you see some of those folks doing on the TV um, are not correct, okay? So let's just get that out first. Uh, they make something on TV called TV profit, which in reality has no closing costs on the buy, no holding costs all the way through, and no closing costs on the sale. I actually saw uh, uh, one TV show uh, that was on uh, at a place I couldn't, couldn't turn off, uh, but they went through this entire presentation, uh, this entire uh, uh, series, and they said, oh, look at that. You bought this house for just 100000 You know, you put 60000 into it, and today that property is worth, uh, congratulations, 180000 You have $20,000 in equity. And I thought, oh, my God, what a disaster. Faster, right? Because what did they pay to, to buy it? What did they pay to close it? What did they pay to hold it for the three to four months that they were doing the renovation? What are they going to pay to resell it? This is not a win at all. In fact, it is a loss. So do be aware of that. We're going to share with you guys what we call the real estate investor maximum allowable offer formula to make sure that you guys buy it right uh, so that you're not looking at losing money at the time that you sell. It's something that's really important to obviously everybody. Um, and I will say because of this, uh, even though fixing and flipping is uh, a fun strategy, is a sexy strategy, is the strategy that many people want to get started with, it's not necessarily a beginner strategy because there is a lot of risk when you are using this strategy. There's a lot of risk when you're doing this. You take on the risk of, did I get my ARV right, right? Did I figure out what the property was going to be worth when it uh, finally sells? Uh, did I get my repairs right? Were there any project surprises? Were there any contractors? Or surprises? Did the market shift during the time that I own that property? And did I get that project finished in a timely manner? So you see a lot of new investors, the first time that they're going through, they say, oh, I'm going to do everything my, themselves, right? So they end up taking twice as long as they otherwise would. So their holding costs are twice as long as they otherwise would be as well. Uh, so you have to be really good at figuring these things out, which means, in my opinion, you've got to have some great people on your power team. You've got to have a great investor-friendly realtor on your power team who knows how to give you the appropriate comps to make sure that you're valuing that proper property correctly. Uh, you have to have a great contractor on your team who's going to finish the project on time and on budget. Uh, one of my least favorite quotes for real estate investing is, my renovation project came in on time and on budget. Who said that? So no one ever, right? So, so please, guys, you will be made or you will be broken based on that scope of work and how detailed you are in that scope of work. And I'll give you some tips as we go through to make sure that you're detailed enough. And you will be made or you will be broken based on any surprises that you didn't initially uncover during the uh, original process working with that contractor and managing that contractor uh, all the way through. So I will just caution you, uh, and, and I know no one's going to really take this caution, but I'll just throw it out there. Uh, you may want to do some of the other strategies that we use as real estate investors before you go all the way to buying, fixing, and flipping a property that has an ARV of 500000 and it's your first deal. Uh, uh, that's, that's, that's a little bit dangerous. Uh, you can partner with other people. I do recommend that you get other people's eyes on your project, other 
other people to walk through your project to advise, yes, this is right, or no, this is wrong, or let's correct this thinking right now. Or uh, And sometimes I see, and I know there are a lot of great realtors in the room, but sometimes I'll see realtors who will give incorrect comps, right? Because the realtor just wants you to do that deal. So, because the realtor is going to get paid whether you're making money or not, right? So they want, in some cases, and I'm not saying every realtor, uh, uh, please, please believe that, but, but, but please be sure to do your own due diligence because no one is going to spend your money like you, like the person that earned it. Is that roughly right? Yep. So, 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 so you guys need to make sure that you've got the right people on your team and that you're double checking that too. So I used to say, trust, but verify. Now I just say, trust no one verify everything, right? And it's only important if you want to make money, and I want all of you guys to make money, so that's why I'm giving you uh, some of these cautionary things. So let's go through uh, the anatomy of a buy, fix, and flip. So first off, uh, you've got to do the marketing, right? Did Phil, I hope, spend some time with you guys convincing you to spend some time on your marketing? Okay, great. Three of you. That's really quite <laughs> impressive. So this is this is this is just you guys are just yeah. I just I'm I'm loving this right now in this moment. How's it go? I can bring them back in here, and you can do that same presentation all over again if you'd like them to. Uh, uh, seriously though, uh, the number one job for any real estate investor, whether you're buying, fixing, and flipping, or whether you're wholesaling, is that you have to be doing the marketing. Okay, uh, that's one thing that you want to see. You see a lot of people uh, want to outsource right away. It's like like, no, who are you gonna who are you gonna outsource this to? This is the key part of your business. And some of you guys have heard me say this, so I'll go ahead and throw it out there again just to make sure that this really uh, resonates for you guys. Uh, you guys are all familiar with Coca-Cola, right? One of the biggest brands in the world. But why does Coca-Cola, being one of the biggest brands in the world, still spend every second of every minute of every hour of every day in every country in every language doing what? Marketing. If that big brand has to do a bunch of marketing in order to keep its business afloat, what does that tell you guys about your tiny little baby brand? You got to do some marketing, right? You got to be able to find these deals. So do the marketing, uh, find the property, uh, negotiate the contract. Uh, we use two um, we use primarily two different kinds of closes. There are more closes even than this, but primarily two different kinds of closes. We use a left brain close that goes through all of the numbers, right? And then we use a right brain close that gets a little bit more to the point, focus more on people, right brainers who want to get a little bit more to the point. The left brainers are when you're dealing with engineers, accountants, um, uh, uh, people who are used to and like to look at numbers to be able to understand them and to understand why you're making them the offer that you're making. The right brainers, they already have the number in their head. They just, when you talk to them, there's just make me an offer, just make me an offer, just make me an offer, right? So we've got both of those different closes that are primary closes. Now, if you are not a left brainer, and just by the looks of you guys, I'm seeing a lot of you guys in here that don't look like left brainers to me, okay? Um, you're going to have, you, you, you might have a little trouble spot right here. So you have, so, and this is only important if you want to make money, but you will have to break down all of the numbers that are in your offer and the reason why you're coming up with this offer. And if you just tell them, well, this lady, Shanoa told me to use the 70% of ARV, this is just the offer we use. Is that going to be sufficient? Okay, the answer is no. The answer is no, it's not going to be sufficient with a left brainer. With a right brainer, yeah, no, that might be sufficient. And then for my left brainers in the room, this is a special little note to you. You're very proud of your, who, who, are, my, who are my left brainers? Are you really proud of your spreadsheets? It's okay. It's okay. Like we, we take some pride in those spreadsheets, right? So I'm a left brainer too. It's like, oh no, I want to show, I want to, you're like, you're the kid in school who like, no, I want to show you my work, right? No, no. The right brainers, no, we don't care to see any of your work. We just want like, just give me the, just get now, you know, while, while my clothes are in style, you know, please. Right. So, so thank you. I love that joke. Uh, so my other one that I like to say too is, while we're young. <laughs> but uh, um, so, so you have to know who you're working with on the other end. So Robert, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you laugh at some point. Like we're going we're gonna, to like, make you laugh tonight. So, so just give, give me a couple more minutes for this. But uh, so you go through the negotiation, understand who you're uh, negotiating 
uh, who your negotiating counterpart is, uh, get it under contract. So I've got two asterisks. Is asterisi? Astra asterisks. Yes. Uh, it's like saying Brett Favre. Uh, but the reason why I have the asterisks here is, is because of this. I want to make sure you guys are all using the correct contract. So the contract that I want you to use is the TREK contract. And I know many of you guys already know this, but for those of you who are new, please use the TREK contract. So you can get there by going to the TREK website. Just Google TREK, T-R-E-C. is the first thing that comes up. Once you get there, you'll click on their forms. Uh, once you get to forms, it's going to open up. 39 different forms, contracts, addendas, disclosures, terminations, etc. If you're buying a single family home, you want to look for the contract called one, two, four family contract. And it's spelled out one O N E, the number, the number two, <laughs> the, the word two T O four F O U R. So that's the contract that you want to look for. They've got several contracts out there. They've got a uh, new home contract an unimproved land or uh, unimproved property contract, as well as a, um, a condo uh, townhouse contract. So be aware of all of those different ones that are out there. So use the right one. Uh, now you notice that I have that Step three is to complete your due diligence. Now to my left brainers, this is going to, some of my left brainers are thinking, oh no, 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 before I put it under contract, I'm going to complete my due diligence. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, so I, 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 I get that and I understand that. But here's what happens. Are we in a competitive market right now here in Austin? Yes. If you are a left brainer who has to like call 10 people and then have your contractor visit the property before you put it under contract, what's going to happen to that property? It's going to be gone to somebody else, right? So, so, and, and here's, and, and, and I know for some of my left brainers, it's like, well, no, I want to get the right answer before I do my presentation. Yes, I, I understand that, but don't, don't let your right answer get in the way of you getting anything. So one of the things that I've learned to say and I've learned myself um, as a left brainer is that perfection is the enemy of production, okay? And a right brainer is going to swoop in and, and guess what? They're going to screw up the offer, okay? They're going to either over offer or under offer, right? But what are they going to do? They're going to offer, right? They're going to put something in front of somebody. They're going to ask somebody to make a decision. And you may have that rug swooped out from under you if you are trying to get all of your due diligence done prior to, prior to um, uh, 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 getting it under contract. What protects us all as real estate investors is in that beautiful 10-page uh, TREK contract, there is an option period. So we get to do what during that option period? All the due diligence that us left brainers need to do, right, to feel comfortable to know that we're making the right decision. How much does it cost us to get that option period? Only $10 for an option period. Now, who are my realtors in the room? Just by raise of hands, my realtors in the room? Okay, some of my realtors in the room are like, $10? Yeah, the, oh, Emilio, <laughs> Emilio, you forget this or what? Come on, you know? <laughs> Uh, so some of my realtors in the room are probably saying $10, like that's, no, that's not how the world works. That's not how the retail world works, right? So if you're putting something <laughs> under contract in the retail world, meaning something that's listed on the MLS, oh yes, your realtor is going to tell you that they're going to ask for somewhere between $100 and a $300 option period, okay? Um, for your option period. And that's very normal. But the houses that we typically buy as real estate investors, well, most of those houses are not on the MLS. Now, some are, but most of them are not on the MLS. And realtors to realtors, when they're dealing with each other, they know, okay, this is the minimum that we expect, right? But when you're working with an individual owner, do they have any idea of, well, option, well the option fee should be this? No, they don't. Do they know what the earnest money should be? No. They don't, right? Uh, and does it really matter to them? In many cases, the answer is not really. Are you going to close on time? Are you going to give me the price I want? Those are the things that I care about, right? So, so remember that as you are working with uh, homeowners. Uh, now, when you're reselling your property after you've fixed it up and made it beautiful and put it on the MLS, when you're reselling that property on the MLS, oh no, you're going to get a $100 to $300 option fee and you will get 1% of the purchase price for your earnest money, right? That's how you know you got a serious buyer. Uh, but when we are buying, we don't use those same rules. So just understand the difference there. So, yeah, yes, yeah. Do you sell the $10 to the title company or do you give it to the 
Uh, for the option, always give the option money to the seller. Always give the earnest money to the title company. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, now, as, uh, as an interesting fact, um, if you do not give the option money to the seller, what does that mean? It's harder to enforce the contract. No, you don't have a contract. You have a contract. No. You have... You buy it let me from here, okay? <laughs> okay? Okay. You have a contract. You just now no longer have an option. Okay? You follow? Now, we've got a beaver in the front row. <laughs> uh, now, if you do not deliver the earnest money to the title company, what happens? You don't have what's called, okay, this is what I have to say, let me time out. I'm not an attorney, CPA, or financial <laughs> advisor, okay, so don't sue me. You have what's called an unenforceable contract, okay? Can you still close on that unenforceable contract? Yes, all day long. As long as you have a willing and able seller, yes. But if your seller, and this never happens, but I'll go through this scenario, Let's say that I put a property under contract with Emilio, okay? And I gave him my $10 option, but I never gave the $10 earnest to the title company. And let's say that Robert later comes by and says, Emilio, man, I'd, I'd like to buy this house. Oh, yeah, I'm, is, is Emilio telling Robert, like, oh, no, can't. I'm already, like, engaged. <laughs> No. What is he saying? What is he saying? Robert, I'd like to know what kind of numbers are we talking about? And Robert, can you beat, Sh I'm not going to tell you about Shanoa, but can you beat Shanoa's? Oh, well, yes, you can. I'm interested. So Robert's going to put it under contract with Emilio. And what's, and what's, and, and then later Robert's going to find out maybe about me or maybe, maybe not, right? Okay. Um, but if Robert's savvy, Robert's gonna, and Robert finds out that you put it under contract with me, Robert might ask the question, has the contract been receded at the title company, and has the earnest money been receded at the title company? Within how many days? No. It's three. It's three days, okay? If not then you and I have an unenforceable contract, which now opens you up to get engaged to Robert. I should have picked you. I'm sorry. I'm, just, I'm sorry. I don't know. <laughs> Robert. Sorry, Robert. I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. I forget the engagement. I mean, I don't see a ring on your finger, so I'm just saying. Uh, House of real estate and merit. I'm waiting for this to happen. Like, I mean, I know there is like some deputized, like, uh, you know, person who can, who can, who can like perform a ceremony tonight. Okay. I'd like to make a love connection. All right. <clears throat> so that opens it up for Robert to put it under contract. Yes. And that opens it up for me to do what? No, no, no. I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. Now, if Robert, I mean, if Emilio was smart, Emilio would come back to me and say, I know you're out. <laughs> Robert's in. But but before I before I finalize with Robert, like, what else you got? <laughs> but here's here's the truth. Here's the truth about sellers. It takes a lot of you know what's to go back to me to tell me that, right? So what instead is Emilio or an Emilio type person gonna do instead? No. Avoid. Like the plague, right? So he's going to ghost me. He's not going to answer the phone. He's not going to answer a text. And none of, no emails. All of a sudden, I'm just gone. Right? And I have to kind of find out later what's happening. But is that my own fault? Yes, yes it is. And do I want that to be any of y'all's faults? No. no, I don't. So that's why we're having this part of the discussion. Make sure that contract is enforceable by delivering that contract, delivering that earnest money to the title company. The, the $10 you give to the seller, you give it a check, so there's always paper. Check? Contract. No, check, cash. On the last page of the contract, they sign, I receive this in the form of okay. check, cash. I mean, I've given quarters before. I mean, that's <laughs> it. I mean, you know, you, you're, yeah, in a, you're in a jam, you know? It's like, I do have like some Chuck E. Cheese tokens from 
my son from uh, I haven't given those away. I don't think that's I don't think that's valuable consideration, but I don't know. Uh, so uh, uh, let's see, let's see. Uh, so complete your due diligence again. ARV, market risk, contractor bids, etc. Get your money together. So we've had several different sources of money come in here tonight to talk to you guys about how they could fund your deals, right? Um, I've got uh, one thing we haven't really talked about is personal money. So I also have an asterisk by personal money, and the reason why that is so is this. Um, some of you guys um, have access to capital, okay? Some of you guys have money that you've saved up, either in uh, your regular corporate America, um, inheritance, um, anything like that. Now, there is a saying that goes something like this. Uh, a fool and his money are soon parted, okay? So just because you are smart, great. Just because you have a high IQ, great. Just because you got a great... SAT, LSAT, MCAT, whatever, you know, score, wonderful. Just because you have different certifications, just because you are really good at a spreadsheet, right? Does that make you smart enough maybe to do a real estate investment? Does that make you smart enough to evaluate all of the different things? Do you have enough tribal knowledge and you have a lot of tribal knowledge in what you're doing today, right? But do you have that same tribal knowledge in real estate investing? If you do not, and, it's, and, and, and it is okay, that, that is okay, but open yourself up for help, open yourself up for advice. Because I see a lot of new investors who have money saved up who want to buy all cash. And I said this earlier when Natalie was in the room, what did I say? So I said, does anybody in here want any free coaching, any free mentoring, any free advice, right? So even if you have saved up money, congratulations. Even if you are smart, wonderful. Some of, and know that some of that knowledge is transferable, but not all of that knowledge is transferable. Get somebody else who has experience to put eyes on your deal to tell you whether or not your deal is really a deal, right? So go to a hard money lender and ask them, will you fund this deal? Again, I said you'll get some of the best free coaching, free advice you'll have ever gotten in your life, right? Have someone with that level of experience put eyes on your deal. Now, I just want to be clear about something. Sometimes, and this is not Natalie, but this is some hard money lenders, okay? Sometimes they'll say, they won't say, no, I'm not going to fund your deal. What's another way of saying, of, of saying your deal is not a deal? 14%, 15%. No, they're going to charge you that anyway. What's another way of them saying that? I need more information. I need more No. If, informa if, by, if by information you mean money, yeah, yes, right? So if they tell you, I will fund your deal if you put down another $20,000, what does that do for the person who's lending your money? It lowers their risk, right? So their loan amount to the value of the property goes down. So if they tell you that, there's like this little translation that if you are new, you may not be able to translate that. What they're tra let, me, let me be your translator tool, right? What that means is you don't really have a deal. And I have had someone come up to me one time, and oh gosh, I must have had like that day, like my son, who's 10, sometimes gets, you know, does stuff, you know, practical joking and stuff. I, I thought maybe that day, like he wrote stupid across my forehead. So this one woman comes up to me and she says, Shanoa, listen, I had, I've had five hard money lenders turn this deal down. But you, Shanoa, you, you should, you should, I see it. You should, you should be fun. You should be funding this deal. I'm like, what do I, I mean, like, did you just even hear what you just said? So, 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 so guys, please, 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 please. When someone's giving you advice like that, take it under advisement. Okay. It'd be smart. Uh, and, and be safe. Uh, guys, just really quickly, um, does anyone in here still have a buzzer? Anyone in here still have a buzzer? Buzzer, no buzzer, buzzers, no buzzers. Uh, if anyone in here uh, did not yet join uh, membership into our association, but would like to join membership into our association, uh, now would be good uh, because they're uh, closing down the membership table. So if you guys want to step outside and join, if you haven't joined, uh, again, the benefits uh, are uh, uh, meetings twice a month, uh, real estate investor blueprint, our three-day training, and uh, even more cool stuff. So uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Bill, uh, for helping with that. So 
again, uh, let's not have any of you guys be a fool with our money as soon parted. Um, um, so, so, so be cautious. We always want to protect that initial investment. Uh, after you've got that money together, after you've done the analysis, then you close the deal, right? But not, not before you've done, thank you, uh, uh, not before you've done that analysis and due diligence. So let's talk about uh, now you're in the deal, okay? So now you're excited, and uh, now you get to start working on your project. So you get to manage the remodel, and you've got to deal with city permits, you've got to deal with inspectors, uh, and the city, any, anyone recently pull an inspection, per, or, pardon me, um, a permit in the city of Austin? No one? Oh, well, I'll save that fun. One of you has, okay, good. Um, um, that is that that might take you a few weeks or it might take you a few months. I know real estate investors who have purchased properties uh, who have gotten all the way through the first six months of their loan term and still had not broken ground because they were still working with the city. Okay. And investors that were now on the fork, I mean, that's all they pay. What have they done? They've just paid holding costs. They haven't even, like, they're not even anywhere closer. And I've seen some of those investors on the foreclosure list because guess what? They're not getting those permits anytime soon or they're just so far behind now. What's happened to all their profit? Let's just let it go. So don't want that to be you guys. Uh, you'll have to deal with project surprises, deal with contractor surprises. Um, so I think uh, many of you guys have heard me say this before. Uh, your best way to uh, vet a contractor what should, what, what should be your first line of defense when you're vetting a contractor? Say it again. Go, Google them. You might say Google them, right? Um, there's there's a there's a new thing called I don't know how new it is. No, not Angie's list. Is that what she said? No, Angel list. Angel list. Oh, Angel list. Okay. Uh, try, try write this down. Mugshots.com. <laughs> It's serious? a thing. And not just for your boyfriends and girlfriends anymore. Yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so now, um, to be clear, uh, Emilio is like, oh, man. <laughs> I'm looking at my guy right now. <laughs> um, now, to be clear, there is not a single one of us in this room that's perfect, okay? Um, and, and I don't claim to be, and I know many of you guys don't claim to be. Every single one of us has done something idiotic or stupid, okay? So let's, let's just put that out there. Um, now, if, if, if the thing that your contractor has done that is idiotic or stupid was like last week and it was armed robbery, uh, then, then yeah, we got a problem here. But it was something like a D, I don't know what, that they did in college or high school or, you know, uh, however long, you know, uh, uh, be, 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 Open, open to that, okay? Uh, unless it happened like you know recently. So, but but that is that is a real thing. I've hired a contractor that someone after I hired them turned me on to this, and I'm like, oh man, this is. And and they'd asked me like that contractor you have. I don't I don't know if I tr I trust. <laughs> and and she looked him up and she freaking found him on mugshots.com. And and on a recent on a recent on a recent thing. Um, so. Uh, and, and I did not fire him because of that. I fired him because he went rogue on my project. But um, uh, that, is a, that is a real source. So, so please, yeah, do look for that. Yes, sir. So you're hiring a general contractor who may hire sub uh, uh, Yes, yes. Do you also monitor them? Uh, no, I don't. Um, so I'll let, my I'll let my contractor handle that. Because uh, 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 sometimes your contractors you will find have their ways. Uh, so, so you guys met Nancy. Um, so Nancy Nancy, whenever she brings her people in, she, she literally says, I'm bringing in the Mexican mafia into my, so she's like, you know, and then I've got one of my girlfriends is Brazilian and she's like, yeah, I'm bringing the Brazilian mafia in here to like get some stuff done. And I'm like, bring them in, <laughs> you know, uh, obviously make sure they're vetted, right? But that's one way to be able to do that. Uh, uh, also look at their current projects, um, uh, verify with the owners that yes, that they were the ones who did those jobs. Cause I've heard of some contractors saying, I did that, I did that, I did that. And it's like, no, you didn't, you like painted a doorknob or something wrong. You know, it's like, no. All right. So, uh, uh, vandalism, vandalism is a thing. Um, air conditioners, uh, stuff happens, uh, uh, weather happens, right? So, so be sure to protect your project, pay all the ongoing expenses, uh, hard money, loan payments, utilities, property taxes, insurance, maintenance, et cetera. 
Uh, and then after your project is done, so after you got through all of that, that, that fun stuff, and guys, I, I will tell you that again, you will be made or you will be broken based on that scope of work with that, and with that, with that contractor. So you were already made or you were already broken based on what you purchased that property at and the due diligence that you did on the purchase. Your next opportunity to be made or to be broken is on managing that contractor and managing that scope of work. Whenever I'm working with a new contractor, the way that I introduce myself is I say, you can call me no change order Shanoa, okay? Because as a contractor, who are my contractors in the room? Okay, as a contractor, contractors make a lot of money on change orders, right? So for what would have cost you $100 on the original bid, if it were part of the original bid, might cost you 200 or 300 because guess what? You're not going to go and bid that one little thing, right? So, so guys... Make sure you go through that project list with a fine-tooth comb to make sure that you've got everything listed on there. Uh, hire a great realtor to put the property on the market. Uh, as we said, we've got a couple of great realtors. Uh, we've got a, several realtors in the room, so uh, people always ask me afterwards, well, how do I find a good realtor? It's like, well, I told them earlier to raise their hands. Were you paying attention during that part? It was like, that was for you. It's not for me. I already, I already got that covered, but it was for you guys. So find those great realtors. They're here as part of the association. I recommend staging the property. Um, um, and, and I'll give you a little quote from, from my stager. Um, and sh I'll give you two quotes. So um, one, uh, my, my first stager said this. She said, buyers don't know what it could be. They only know what they see. Okay. And that's very true. So especially in some of the projects, properties that we get as real estate investors are, are kind of Franken houses, right? It's like, oh, we decided to add, you know, some weird room and you know, it's like, this doesn't make sense to anybody until you make it a space. And a lot of times these stagers have the vision to make it a space. Uh, the other thing that one of my uh, stagers said to me, and this was recently, she said, Shinoa, <clears throat> the price of staging will be less than the amount of your first price break off of your list price. Oh. Right? You can probably drop your list price by, you know, on a $300,000 property, you might drop it by five grand. Mm -hmm. What would it cost you to stage it? Maybe three, right? So, so, so think about that. Houses that are staged sell faster and they sell for more money, okay? So that's, that's, that's just, uh, uh, that's my advice to you guys. Uh, prepare the properties for pictures, put it on the MLS, <clears throat> wait for an offer, maintain the property in the meantime, uh, receive an offer, negotiate it, counter agreed to terms, review the buyer's financial strength. Uh, don't be surprised that some uh, realtors will put buyers in their car that are realtors that are not, or uh, buyers that are not really vetted. Um, there's nothing more frustrating to the seller's agent, uh, to the seller, right, than having a buyer who's not really been put through and vetted, doesn't either have the down payment, doesn't have the credit, doesn't, hasn't been at their job long enough. And you see that a lot with people who are moving here to Austin brand new. It's like, you know, yeah, I got this new $150,000 job. Well, I've been living in Austin for two and a half months. And my last job, well, I was making 75 in a different industry. Well, <clears throat> as the realtor looks at it, it's like, yeah, you know, you're making a lot of money. You got to do good down payment. But as the lender looks at it, no, you're a risk because you have not been at that job for a certain amount, of, you know, so be aware of that. Uh, uh, go under contract, uh, get your earnest money and contract to the, have your buyer get the earnest money and contract to the title company. You take the option fee. Uh, buyer will complete their inspections and renegotiate the contract. Okay. This is a thing. Uh, even if you have a brand new house, you're going to get like a, 24 page inspection report. The city of Austin and the Trek inspectors, they don't hold hands and sing kumbaya on their agreement on how the house should be built in Texas. Okay. So you may have, and you, you may have your license electrician. No, no, I did everything right. And I even got everything passed by the city. No, my work here is done. Okay. And this property got a certificate of occupancy. No, the city says that I built this property correctly, but the truck inspector may say, Oh, no, this. Blah, blah, blah. So who's right? Sure. Yes. <laughs> Whoever can. So, so I would say no. And in, in this market, we're in a hot market, right? 
someone says, oh, no, we've got all this list of problems. And I say, well, gosh, I mean, right after I went under contract with you, I got a higher offer from somebody who wants to pay cash. So if you'd like to, if you'd like to terminate, you know, now, now would be good, right? And what do they say? Oh, no, I'll take it, <laughs> right? Now, when the market is back where it was in 2010, we have nine months of inventory, and someone says, oh, well, no, the roof's messed up. You say, oh, well, would you like, you know, uh, the, ar- the roof with the architectural shingles? Uh, would you like a drip edge? Would you like, a, would you like the, the, the roof vent on the top? You know, can I, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I repaint it for it? You know, so depending on where we are in the market and depending on where you are with that property, if you've held that property for six months and you haven't got an offer, no, you will do what is needed to do to get that thing uh, sold. Uh, but be aware that there may be some counter offers or some reduction in prices. Uh, wait for the buyer's lender to start the loan. Uh, how many of my realtors in the room have had to extend a contract because a lender could not close on time? Right? That is very, very, unfortunately, very common. Uh, let's just hope that we get to the closing line, right? But do be aware of that. Uh, get the appraisal back. Now, sometimes appraisals don't come in at sales prices. Okay, what do you do if you're the seller? If you're the buyer's agent and you just went under contract for 350000 and the sales price came in at 340000 what do you say? <laughs> Lower your price. Right? If you're the seller, what do you say? <clears throat> You can say, let's get another appraisal. Is that allowed? Yes. Who's paying for that appraisal? That'd be the seller. Right. That's not, that's not a huge deal, right? If you put your money where your mouth is, right? But how can you circumvent that whole situation? There is a new form, and, and, be, and there's a new form on the Trek website because Trek got tired of realtors uh, practicing law. Okay, and writing things into special provisions that maybe we should not have been writing into special provisions. So what we used to do is we used to write into special provisions, especially us as real estate investors, because are we making these big, beautiful houses and are we trying to sell at the top of the market? Absolutely. And does sometimes we not always hit our appraisals? Stuff happens, right? So we will write into the contract, we used to write into the contract in special provisions in the event that the property does not appraise for the sales price. I'm going to cover this in advance, right? The buyer will increase their down payment in order to secure the loan. That's good looking out, right? Because if something goes wrong, yeah. Now, there are certain realtors who have said to me over the years, that's illegal, you can't do that. What? No. I'm just trying to protect what you said you... Now, you did say you would pay three fifty, dollars or did you not? You said you would. You believe this property is worth three fifty, dollars did you... So who cares what they say? If, and I've got multiple offers. So, and then most would huff and puff, and some would huff and puff, and some were smart, and some would say, well, wait a second, we got to cap this thing at some point. Okay, I'm open to that. <laughs> right? So you might cap it to the most increase that they would bring to the closing table would be $10,000. Now, if you get a buyer who's been shopping and has been in multiple, multiple offer scenarios, now what are they going to do? Whatever it takes to get that house. Yes, no, I will sign. Yes, that sounds fair to me. So uh, Trek um, has graciously, uh, uh, so that us realtors don't have to write that in and practice law, if you will. Uh, <clears throat> they created a new form. It is on the Trek website. Uh, it, uh, 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 it's called Buyer's Right to Cancel Due to Appraisal, approximately something like that. Uh, so it's one of the new forms that they came out with. So it, it will address that. It will say the, the buyer can cancel. Yeah. Or the buyer can increase their down payment. Yes. Uh, and there are some other little tricks. I don't want to go into them now, but that's, those, those, those are the big ones. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Close on the property, pick up your check, cash it, have a wonderful day, and go and rinse and repeat over and over again. Yes, yes? Now, uh, some of the offer formulas. Um, this is the basic offer formula that we use as real estate investors. 70% of the ARV minus repairs. This offer works like magic on houses that are priced between $150,000 and 350000 okay? It works terrible on houses that are priced under 100000 
okay? Because on a $300,000 house, if you're making somewhere between 10 to 15% of your ARV, you're making somewhere between 30 and $45,000. If something goes terribly wrong, like, oh gosh, I got to put a new roof on this thing. I didn't think that I would. Or I've got to put in a new air conditioning. I didn't think that I would. <clears throat> it sucks. But guess what? You're still making a ton of money, right? But on a $100,000 house, where you're only making still, your, your margin percentage is the same, 10 to 15% but you're only making ten dollars to $15,000. So if you have to put in a new roof and or a new air conditioning system, guess what? Your day just got totally ruined. So 70% formula doesn't work great on the lower end properties and on the higher end properties where your margins are, margin dollars are so high. Can you afford to give back some of that to the, yes, you can. So just be aware that there are some limitations to this formula, uh, but this is a good one to kind of uh, start with as the basis for your, uh, as the basis for um, your, your offers. Um, now, if you're wholesaling, um, again, you may offer a little bit lower, but do <coughs> note that if you are wholesaling, that there is an opportunity that someone else who is not wholesaling is going to come in and offer a little bit more than you are. So sometimes that wholesale fee just kind of gets absorbed by the end buyer on that transaction. Uh, let's see, some advanced offers and variations. So I don't recommend that you stray from this formula unless or until you have done multiple deals, right? Unless or until you feel very comfortable and confident about your ARVs, unless you've got a great relationship with your contractor and have checked mugshots.com. Uh, uh, you may adjust your offers for time value of money, renovation risk. Uh, if you're in an area where there's a septic system, where there's a well, uh, where, where, uh, uh, where you're increasing uh, the size of the home outside of the existing footprint, right? Adding square footage, right? Are you going to offer a little bit more? No, because there's a lot of risk to you if one of those things doesn't go right, right? But if you're just doing a basic paint and carpet job, and this is, and by the way, you'll never get one of those, but if, if you were to get one, um, then can you pay a little bit more? The answer is yes, because your renovation risk is very low. Uh, if you already have a buyer. So there have been times in the past where we have negotiated what I would consider a crappy deal, but because we had a buyer already in place who was willing to pay another $10,000 on top of the crappy deal that I negotiated, am I going to go outside of my formula? Yes, I will, right? Because I'm just going to put it under contract and wholesale it to somebody else. Um, um, adjust offers at a minimum profit dollar amount. Again, on the $500,000 homes where you're making 50 to 75 at a minimum, assuming you manage everything properly, can you afford to give back some more? Yes, but on the lower end ones, no, you can't. Analysis and due diligence as a fix and flip investor, you have to be an expert at analysis and due diligence, at figuring out what that ARV is, at figuring out that renovation, uh, uh, that renovation expense. And one tip that one of our coaches taught us um, a long time ago was this, and I still do this to this day because partially I'm a left brainer and this is just how we roll, right? I always do best case, worst case, most likely case. Most new investors only use one case scenario analysis in their analysis. What case is that? The best case on steroids, right? They use the highest ARV. They use the lowest renovation cost because that makes sense. What? No, right? They use the shortest holding time. They use the lowest days on market for how quickly it's going to sell. And that's the only thing that they look at. Guys, look at that best case scenario, Okay. And know that you're going to come in somewhere in between. But if the worst case scenario scares the crap out of you and might make you file for bankruptcy, rethink that, rethink that offer or rethink that project, right? But the best case scenario has you getting out of bed like it's like you're six and it's Christmas morning, meaning you're waking your parents up at 4.30 a.m., right? And it's like sparks you and you're not afraid of that worst case scenario because it still looks good, go do that deal. <clears throat> Um, we'll go through some of the, um, I'm going to go through, um, this next section, just give you some of the basics on, uh, in terms of rules of thumb for what you should expect to spend. So, um, if you're renovating a home and these are kind of general numbers, so built from 1920 to roughly 1990, you'll probably spend somewhere between 40 and $60 a square foot. 
assuming that you're reselling that home for at least $300,000. So for example, on a 1970 home, okay, which needs about how much work? Every, we're moving walls, we're redoing electrical, right? We may be doing foundation, we're probably doing a roof, we might be, well, definitely doing a new kitchen, a new bathroom, right? 2,000 square feet, you're spending $60 a square foot on that home if you're selling it for any dollar amount above 300,000. So that's a $120,000 remodel, okay? On a house that was built in 1990, that you're selling for 300,000, where you probably don't need new windows, where you probably don't need new doors, where the foundation's probably still pretty good, right? Then you might be spending on the lower end of that, depending on how far gone that property is, but maybe $40 or even less in terms of dollar per square foot. Now, uh, new build. Uh, so uh, new, build city, new build outside of the city of Austin, about $125 a square foot. New build inside the city of Austin, at least $150 a square foot, which sounds ridiculous, and it is. And I'm going to just give you one example of uh, some properties that Phil and I uh, just built in East Austin. <coughs> So um, we built a, a, a four-house condo regime, and um, when we went to the city to connect into the city sewer for these four houses, the city um, handed us a drawing to say, here is where uh, you can connect into the city <coughs> sewer. And we're like, wonderful, great. So we get, and, and, and this drawing, by the way, I'm going to see if I can find, I'm going to see if I can, I'll give you, I want to give you guys a quick example of what this drawing looked like. Well, um, this this is this is a, another drawing that I got on an, on another property, but it's but it's kind of the equivalent. So <laughs> you guys can't see this very well. Exhibit A. This 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 this, this looks like yeah yeah this looks like my you know my ten year old when he was five he drew that do you guys see that exhibit A yeah exhibit A you guys see that yeah why would you need anything else? you see this yeah see that yeah oh shoot see that yeah. Came from the city. Charles, you've you, you know, as a contractor, you've seen these, some of these drawings before, right? And there's not even a note that says not drawn to scale. <laughs> so, so we go to where the city says, "Hey, you're, this is where you connect in." And guess what? It was not there. So, what does the city say? <laughs> no. What else? And what else do they say? Say that again, Charles. $30,000. $30, to where would, we, would you like us to remit the bill and the payment? Yes. Yes. No. Yeah, no, I'm paid for that. Because the city used to plan like a, fifth, like a five-year-old. Yes. Ask Charles. Ask me. I should not have to pay that. Yes. And guess what? The city is also making you in, in, in neighborhoods like this one we were building in, also build a sidewalk to nowhere. What does that mean? Oh, we've got a new sidewalk project going on. So, uh, and I was like, wait, what? There are no sidewalks on this entire street. There will be in your yard. Oh, wow. You've seen, I mean, some of you guys have seen like, what is the sidewalk? What? How about the sidewalk here? It's like, it doesn't even make any sense. Yes. No, I'm just talking about like you go eight houses, no sidewalk, and you go one house and it's like, sidewalk? What? Well, thank you, I guess. I mean, uh, 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 write this down. Uh, Carlos, write this down. Um, I, no, I know, I know. Um, we're, we're from the government and we're here to help. <laughs> Some of you are like, uh. <laughs> so, so yeah, so they do some things like that, right? So, and you know, what, what's, what's funny is on the one hand, and I'm sorry, I'm going down a rabbit hole right here and I'm on a soapbox. Uh, I'll get off it in just one more comment. On, 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 on the one side, the city is saying what? There's just no affordable housing in the city of Austin. We've got to do something immediately about that. Yeah, how about make investors 
spend $30,000 to fix your error, right? Or how about let's have investors spend $3,000 building a, building a sidewalk that goes to nowhere. They're not connecting these dots, right? Well, who does the investor pass this on to? The buyer. Does that make the city of Austin more affordable? Because, like, no. Don't forget to vote. We got a registration, voter registration. <laughs> I'm, done. I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. I'm done. That's it. I, I, I stop, I stop, I stop, I stop, I stop. Okay. Another really important rule of thumb. When you're trying to figure out how long is it going to take me to finish this project, okay, take your renovation budget and divide that by $5,000. So if you have a $50,000 renovation budget, divide that by $5,000, that will give you the number 10. Yes? It'll take you about 10 weeks to get that done. Now your contractor tell you, oh no, I can get this done in about six weeks. And you say, mm-hmm. Yes. Well, it's like, and, and, then, and then it's like, you know, the, well, then there was rain. Is that some kind of a surprise? <laughs> or then there was dealing with the city, which, you know, they should know. It takes a long time, right? So, so but this is, this is what, now, this is on an, an average project. If you're dealing within the city of Austin, maybe only divide by 4,000, okay, a week to get your amount of time. Ah, this is really important. Uh, for every $10,000 that you spend for your renovation, you should have at least a one-page scope of work. So if your project is a $50,000 project, you should have at least five pages for your scope of work. Get incredibly detailed in that scope of work. You will be made or you will be broken based on that scope of work and how detailed it is. And I'm dead serious about this. Most contractors, they want to give you a bid that says, fix house, $50,000. Charles, have to well, now would be good, right? <laughs> right? Because it takes, so for me to build the scope of work, it takes me about 30 minutes per page. That's a long time detailing all the stuff that needs to be done. But every time that I have skipped on that scope of work, it has cost me money on the back end. Do not, yes, I know, and, and left brainers, like you will love this. Right brainers, you will just, it will be very painful, okay? So, so then get somebody else to do it. Otherwise, you're going to come in, you're going to be the person, if you're a right-brainer and you can't do this, then you're going to be the person who started with a $30,000 budget and ended with a $60,000 budget. And I kid you not, okay? Now, how many of you guys have been to Rich Dad or Dan Merrill or any of these other places? Yes, yeah, some of you guys, like they're the cheerleading squad for Go Real Estate, yay! I'm like the mother of that, you know, it's like I want to tell you not just the things you want to yeah, invest in real estate, I want to tell you the whole, the whole thing. So we always kind of say the truth, the whole tr truth, and nothing but. Ah, okay, so in summary, the truth. Uh, fixing and flipping is exciting, super profitable, but it's not always a great getting started strategy. There's a lot of risk. It's difficult to find a great contractor, uh, but if you manage your marketing well, right? If you manage your scope of work well, if you manage your contractors well, if you get a great team surrounding you to put eyes on your project, guess what? You're going to win and you're going to make a lot of money as a real estate investor. But please, guys, uh, do your analysis and do your due diligence to make sure you get it. Make sure you get it right. That's that's the most important thing, uh, and and in everything that we do in life, right? So, uh, Robert, I did not have an opportunity to make you laugh. Give me another chance next time. Maybe we'll work something out, okay? Yeah. So, so for the rest of you guys, thank you all for uh, coming here tonight. I hope you um, uh, took away at least something, and and hopefully many things of value. And we'll see you at the next uh, meeting. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. Yes, Carlos.